Well, welcome home. Welcome back. I can't tell you how good it is to see people out here. I, first service, I told them the same thing. It was, you know, the last three months, it's just been me standing here and talking to an empty room. So it's so good to see you all here. Thank you. I don't know how long we're going to be meeting in this format, two services. Um, you know, if numbers keep going up, then we may end up going back to an all uh, online service. I don't know. Uh, it's just all up in the air right now. So, yep, play it by ear. That's right. So y- yesterday, I, I shared this in the first service, I um, did a funeral up in Canyon Creek Campground. And uh, I, I work part-time in hospice. And so this is one of the hospice patients that had passed away. And um, I went out and met with him. And uh, he'd been to church a couple times, but, you know, wasn't a Christian, didn't really have a good understanding of any of that. And, uh, but he was really, really interested. And I, I shared with him my favorite Bible passage, which is Psalm 121. You know, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And he... He, he was really into it. He kept asking for more and more. And so uh, I, I walked him through the, the steps of becoming a Christian and you know, giving your heart to Christ. And uh, <clears throat> he became a Christian that day. And uh, that night he passed away. Um, this was back in May, so it was before my surgery. And, uh, but the funeral was yesterday. And I, I went out to Canyon Creek Campground yesterday to do the funeral and uh, I'm out there and I get there and, you know, there's a bunch of people smoking and, and drinking. And I'm going, okay, well, this will be interesting. And, uh, uh, you know, they had the hard alcohol out, just everything. And, you know, they're just going, okay, well, God, this is all you. And um, we get started. And, and so I, I started reading. Uh, I read Psalm 121 to them. I read Psalm 23. Uh, you know, I read some from Ecclesiastes and, and Romans and and. And we hadn't even really started talking about the, the, the individual who had passed, but a number of people started just crying. Just crying from having the word of God read to them. Um, and so I, I think it's so important that we stay in the Bible. It's so important that we read from it all the time so that, so that anytime someone asks us something, we have that standard to go back to, to share with them, uh, to share his love and hope with them. Um, so yeah, it was, it was amazing. You know, I, I told Crystal last night, I go, I don't, I don't know if I'll ever do another funeral like that again. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if God prompts me to, uh, you know, I, sh- I should be obedient. Um, because people heard God's word and they at least have an idea of who he is and, and what, how his love shapes our world, uh, shapes his world. Uh, but yeah, well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for being able to come back together uh, uh, and you know trying to do it safely. And uh, but God, would your would your wisdom just pour down on us? God, help us to make good decisions in the days ahead, and help us to lean not on our own understanding, God, but but to ask you what it is that you would have us do. Uh, Father, I thank you for everyone that's here, and uh, God, for those who are staying home and will be watching the recording later. God, I, I pray for them as well. Uh, Father, help us to be your hands and feet. Help us to share your love and to, to be harbingers of hope, God, uh, to, to this lost world, to this world that's fallen in sin. Uh, God, you have a plan for it, and we want to come alongside you and take part in that. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So the format's going to be a bit different. We're going to be starting announcements here in just a second. Uh, we're only going to be doing two songs. Uh, but this was just to kind of uh, shorten things up to facilitate doing two services. So I, I, hope, uh, I hope you'll follow along. And uh, if you have any concerns, uh, that takes me into our announcements. I will be at Augie's again starting on Tuesday from 9 to 11. So if you have anything you want to talk about, come down and talk to me at uh, 9 to 11 at Augie's. VBS, Vacation Bible School, is going to be taking place August 10th to the 14th in the city park. Uh, that is our plan as of right now. Uh, everything's kind of up in the air. We're going to wait a couple more weeks and see how everything sets out before we are definitively uh, do a hard yes, um, but we need help. So if you would like to volunteer your time, we're going to be outside. 
perfect. Uh, perfect. So, uh, but you can talk to myself or Melina Van Brunt, Chad's wife, um, if you'd like to volunteer or give some money or help out in some other way. Uh, that would be great. Uh, we had a few kids come back from camp yesterday. Uh, we had some kids come back from camp the week before. We have some kids leaving for camp tomorrow morning and some more leaving the next week. Uh, it, it's always incredible when kids go to church camp, how they come back and they are just so on fire for God. Uh, and so I would encourage you to be praying for those kids that have come back already, that, they, that that fire would just stay kindled, that it, they would just burn brightly for him and stay in his word. And for those that are going, pray that they would experience a deeper walk with him, coming to know who he is and, and what he's done for them. But uh, and I have another announcement. It's, it's more of a praise. Um, I forgot to share this with the first service. I, I got a text this morning from my friend Mark Grobish. Um, he left on, I think, Friday. It was Thursday or Friday. He left. He is headed back to uh, uh, help his brother move to where his dad lives and to get his dad kind of a little more settled. His dad's coming out of a, a skilled facility and going in, back into the house. Um, but he said, God is good. I had a bearing go out on my brother's boat trailer la last night about midnight near Black River Falls, Wisconsin. I had pulled into a rest area just to stretch after sitting in a vehicle for too long. When I did my routine check, I noticed that I had an issue with the wheel on the boat trailer. I borrowed a jack from the maintenance guy here at the rest area this morning. When I jacked the trailer up, the wheel was just flopping back and forth. God is the only reason the wheel didn't come off while I was driving. I've run into some wonderful people here in Wisconsin this morning, people willing to help, and I'm waiting on a guy to show up to load this thing up as the spindle is damaged as well and will need to be replaced. God is good. I really didn't expect to find people so willing to help me, especially on a Sunday morning. My faith in mankind has been somewhat renewed on this trip already. I'm traveling well armed, thinking I might encounter problems as we've seen around our great nation lately, but so far, it's just been kindness and love. Feel free to share this with our church family this morning. God bless. So Mark is on his way, and things are going better than they could have been for him. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. Does anyone else have anything they want to announce, anything that's going on that we need to be made aware of? No? Okay. We'll get to that later. Yep, yep. All right, well, if you are able, I invite you, and, and I mean able, able. Uh, I'm going to be reading the entirety of the book of John, chapter 19. So if you're able, I invite you to stand out of respect for God's word. If you need to sit, that's fine too. John, chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, the king of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back into the palace. Where do you come from, he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me, Pilate said? Don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and set him on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over 
to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it, was the time of, now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man, who saw it was, the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. All right, Chad is going to be leading us in worship this morning, so let's follow along with him. Good morning. So the uh, Miles family is taking a very well-needed break, uh, and they're also doing some haying today, so or this week. So I'm going to lead us in worship, and we'll start with uh, "O Come to the Altar" in celebration of coming back to church. So really glad to be here with y'all. come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. 
Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Is risen. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. Thank you, Chad. Oh, go back to prayer, sorry. So uh, instead of taking a regular offering, if you have anything you'd like to give, there is a uh, offering plate in the back. You can give it on your way out, and that would be just great. Thank you. Um, but I want to remind you that uh, our entire lives are to be an offering to God, not, not just our money, but our time, our energy. Our, every resource we have is a gift from him. Um, we're going to be sharing some prayer requests this morning. Um, I'm going to start off, though, uh, with a prayer request. Uh, T.J. Bruce, um, most of you know who he is. Uh, he appears to have cancer. Um, that is the way he told me in which to say it. Uh, so he's in talks with doctors now about how to begin treatment. Uh, he met with a surgeon to talk about chemotherapy and then surgeries on down the line after that. Um, the Bruce family's been hit really hard this last year. Um, I, I went over there on Friday and uh, I don't know if you've ever been to TJ's place, but you go up to Harmony Heights and you take a right, the, the first one, and you go about a mile and a half and you come to their house. 
Well, they, their house just happens to be on the other side of a bridge that they are right now um, rebuilding. So I had to drive around the other way on Friday. And it was my first time driving Harmony Heights Loop that direction. Uh, and it was quite beautiful. I got lost, but it was quite beautiful. <laughs> um, but uh, Suk is in good spirits, and uh, uh, TJ, you know, he's, he's a bit down, um, but he's doing better. Um, you know, he has Parkinson's already, so this on top of that just kind of uh, kind of taking the wind out of his sails. Um, but he could really use some encouragement from his church family. Um, he's not currently, I don't believe, answering his phone. At least he hasn't for me. Uh, but um, if you want to reach out to him, maybe send him a letter. Uh, their address is in the church directory. Um, that would be a great way to just kind of let him know you're praying for him and that they're loved. Um, but that is, uh, that is the first prayer request this morning. Is there any other prayer requests? Well, my shoulder is doing pretty well. I think maybe this Thursday I'll get to stop wearing this silly sling. Um, I, I am done with it. Uh, it is warm outside, and so it's causing me to get awfully sweaty there. Uh, but, yeah, I, I am really looking forward to not wearing that anymore. Uh, too much information. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> right, exactly. We're family. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and go to prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we, we lift up our unspoken prayer request to you this morning, God. Uh, God, you, you know so much better than we do what it is that we need. And so, God, we lay it at your feet and ask for your will to be done. Uh, God, would you give us wisdom to make the decisions you would have us make. And God, give us the courage uh, to do what it is you're calling us to. Uh, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all the ways you bless us. And, and God, we lift up... Uh, TJ, especially this morning to you, but uh, also Souk, um, and God, would you be with them and uh, be with their families as in the days ahead as decisions are made and, and, and things get done, uh, but God, if there's any needs that they have, God, I, I pray that uh, they would be made known so that we could uh, meet those needs, uh, God, whether it's firewood or ride somewhere or whatever it is, uh, God, but also if there's anyone else in the church, uh, you know, I remember Remembering particularly right now, uh, Theron and Coral Bruce, you know, who are still on the road to recovery. Um, God, and you know, people that are going out for surgery. Uh, Carlene just had surgery this last week. Uh, keep her in our prayers as well. And, uh, but God, we just lift up all those to you. And God, pray that you would uh, help them to speak if there's anything that they need so that we can be your hands and feet to them. Uh, God, as well as our community. Uh, we thank you, Lord. Uh, in your holy name we pray. Amen. So I think I've covered all the bases. I think. Not 100%, but I think so. So this morning in John chapter 19, we're going to be talking about a guy that uh, really gets a bad rap, uh, Pontius Pilate. He's just a a guy trying to do a job. Um, You know, is he though? So we come to this point in time where, where we have Lord Jesus who is both God and man. And at this moment there are judges among men who, who, are, who are about to finally decide the fate of the one who will ultimately be their judge for eternity. I think it's probably, well, no, I, I, I don't think probably. I think it is the greatest mistake in human history, the greatest injustice ever done, the greatest crime ever committed, and the best proof there is of mankind's wicked nature and our demonstration of need for judgment. But at the same time, ironically, in the same moment and by the same action, And only because of God's grace and mercy, this horrible decision will be turned into the most incredibly hope-filled, life-giving series of events in history. 
a death that, that at the same time is a horrendous crime also becomes the salvation for everyone who comes to faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So there's a death which results in Christ's resurrection from the dead and also results in the resurrection of the dead of all who believe in him. And so this morning, we're gonna look on the actions of this one man, this, this poor guy, Pontius Pilate, uh, who this judgment of the ages fell upon. Uh, you know, he was an ambitious Roman politician who'd been given an assignment as governor of this seemingly insignificant, distant Roman province that went by the name of Judea. Uh, a province that w- was infamous for, for its zealots followers uh, of this strange monotheistic religion. That, you know, the Romans, you know, they had a God for everything. Um, but these Jewish people, they only worshipped one God. And, and these people repeatedly rose up against Roman authority. And so, so this is the situation that this man is dealing with. And so what we learn this morning is, is how not to decide about Jesus, how not to respond when faced with, with critical spiritual decisions that will affect our future as well as the future of others. And so this morning what we're also going to talk about is what to do. Because ultimately the buck stops with you. Everyone's heard that phrase before, right? The buck stops here. The buck stops with you. Last week, we, we finished up in John chapter 18, and, and, and Pilate had already interviewed Jesus uh, somewhere in the early morning hours between 3 and 6 a.m. Uh, at the demand of the chief priests of the Jews who'd already commi- who had already condemned Jesus to death uh, for his blasphemy of claiming to be the Son of God. But you see, they, they've now abandoned that charge for other trumped-up charges that would be violations of Roman law. Pilate has concluded that he can find no guilt in Jesus and seeks to release him as part of a traditional favor uh, to the Jewish people at Passover. But last week as we ended, we, we heard the crowds crying for the release of Barabbas. This, this robber, this murderer, this insurrectionist guy instead of Jesus, the man without sin. And And In the Gospel of Luke, uh, about this time, uh, Pilate decides to shift the responsibility to someone else, a guy named Herod Antipas, uh, the person who was responsible over the area of Galilee, which is where Jesus was from. But Herod sends him back. He doesn't want to have to deal with it. And so Pilate is seeking some other way to get rid of Jesus without riling up the Jews. So he he listens to the crowd's reflections and decides to come up with some other way. And so in 19.1 here, he he takes Jesus and has him scorched. And so what this means is that Pilate sent him to be punished by flogging or whipping. Uh, He was hoping that that by inflicting punishment upon him, that uh, this is a pretty severe judgment, but it's not death usually, uh, that the Jews would be satisfied, that they would have some mercy Now, most of you know that uh, a scourging or flogging of a person is a very severe punishment. It's it's done with a whip that's made of many cords and glass, lead, and bone fragments are attached to them with the intent of creating these huge lacerations or stripes on the victim's body. Stripes, isn't that somewhere in Isaiah? By his stripes, we are healed. By his suffering for our sins, we are healed of our sins. Now back then, the Jewish law limited flogging to 39 lashes. But the Romans didn't have that rule. The Romans' rule was whoever was flogging them could keep going until they got tired. But once they were tired, they had to stop. No one else could pick up for them. So we don't know how many lashes Jesus took. Now each of those lashes could remove a lot of flesh, cause a lot of bleeding, and at times in floggings, sometimes bones or or, or even your entrails were exposed. And so a lot of people did die from it. 
but not Jesus. All this is happening to an innocent man. A, a man who was not only innocent of the charges leveled against him, but a man who was innocent from any sin. None of us can claim that. So how did that incredible injustice come about? How did that come to pass? It came to pass because Pontius Pilate listened to who? He listened to the crowd. He listened to the people around him. He listened to the world. He listened to the wicked, sinful, merciless voices of the world and did their bidding rather than what he knew was right. And so when it comes to making a decision in our lives, especially about Jesus, but about any significant decision in our lives, it it ultimately is spiritual. Don't listen to the crowd. Don't listen to the world. And you know why? Because the world is going to lead you astray. It's wicked, corrupt. Mankind, and especially the world, isn't concerned generally about what's good and what's right. Instead, it's fueled by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. We talked about that last week in our life group uh, in 1 John. And so when it comes to, to what is right and just, people don't want to be confused with facts. They don't want to be confused with commandments because we already know how we want to live. We already know how we want to live. Sinful for ourselves, no matter what it means for others. And so don't be lulled into a false sense of security that, that the world in general, the crowd, especially a crowd with a mob mentality like, like is here, don't think that they know what's best or that they speak on behalf of God and justice. For God has already made a declaration with regard to the true nature of mankind in the world. This is Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. So by following the crowd, by doing the norm, when it comes to major decisions and even minor ones, it's a huge mistake if we follow the world. And I don't think there's ever a better example of that than right here in John chapter 19. So Pilate brings this battered, bloodied, bruised, abused Jesus out in in those purple robes and and that crown of thorns and and he says, behold the man. Behold the man. Behold the man who was God. Behold the man who suffered for our sins. Behold the man who suffered for your sins. Behold the man who suffered for my sins. Not for his own. Even this foreign governor knew that he was blameless. But now eternity echoes that truth that this man, this son of God, suffered and died for the sins of you and I. And the world of mankind paid him back by putting him on a cross. Now the Jews, they, 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 they're aware that these trumped up charges against Jesus have failed. And so they revert back to the real charge that they had convicted Jesus of blasphemy. We have a law and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. In other words, never mind about the Roman laws that weren't violated. Never mind that we lied in the first place. We have our reasons and we want him crucified. And so Pilate's even more afraid at this point. He's even more afraid at this point because Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. And so Pilate finds himself in this double bind in this, you know, this area between a rock and a hard place. He wants to let Jesus go because he knows Jesus is innocent, but he also doesn't want to go against the Jewish leaders because 
he knows that they'll create a problem for him. And then, and then he receives a note. Uh, if you read in Matthew verse, chapter 27, verse 19, he receives a message from his wife saying that she had a dream about Jesus and to have nothing to do with this. Now, now Pilate was not inclined to follow Jesus. That, that, that was, he made that clear uh, in chapter 18. But he'd also heard these legends about Roman gods and Roman gods having children. Everyone knows who Hercules is, right? Right? Roman gods having children. So maybe this Jesus guy, he's not sure. He's not sure. Because, because this Jesus guy, you know, he had this bearing about him. He was never out of character. Even in the worst of circumstances, after he's been beaten, after he's been brutalized, after he's been abused and, and, and on trial for his life, he has this composure. He doesn't break character. And somehow, even now, while all of this has taken place, it still seems like he's in charge. And so Pilate is afraid. And so he needs to know who is this man. And so he goes to him and says, where are you from? What kind of consequences could Pilate possibly be bringing on himself in case he judged wrongly? If he had anything to do with the crucifixion of Jesus, as his wife had warned him, and he's the son of a God, what kind of consequences could he have? The stakes are high. And do you know what happens? Pilate asks him, who are you? Where are you from? And Jesus doesn't answer him. Jesus didn't answer him because back in John chapter 18, Pilate had asked him that question before and Jesus had answered it then. If Pontius Pilate didn't believe him just a few hours before, what, why would he believe him now? And so Jesus doesn't answer. Then Pilate gets mad. He says, don't you understand that I have the power to set you free or to have you crucified? And it's only then that Jesus speaks. It's only then that he says, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me has the greatest sin. And so we have to think in regards to the decisions or choices that we make in life, especially in regard to whether we believe in and follow Jesus. What would Jesus have us do? What would Jesus do? And, and, and what would constitute sin against Jesus? You see, when it comes to making those decisions in our lives, especially those that are going to affect us spiritually, we have to think those questions. We have to think those thoughts and ask those things in our own heads. Because ultimately, he is the one that will judge us. And, and it seems like Pilate takes for a moment to, to heed Jesus' word. And, and he seeks all the more to release him. And the text, the text doesn't really tell us the extremes he goes to in order to release him, in order for him to be found not guilty. Uh, but he still has those pesky Jewish chief priests to deal with. And even though he despises them, he knows that his welfare depends on placating them. The Jews oppose him. With Caesar on the throne and, and this man be claiming to be the king of Jews, you see the Caesar on the throne at the time was Caesar Tiberius. And he was one of the most paranoid Caesars. So not only could this Caesar depose Pilate, you know, take him out of his role of authority, he could also have him killed if it was proven that he was sympathetic to a treasonous Jew. And so, Pilate demonstrates his, the, the fatal flaw in our human decision-making process. When we fear men more than we fear God. 
Proverbs 29 says, the fear of man is a snare. But Jesus says this, do not fear man who can kill the body, rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. That's from Matthew 10. And so Pilate does his best to shift the blame to the Jews, to deny any responsibility or guilt over Jesus' fate. He takes a basin of water. Everyone knows this, right? This is, this is one of those things that we're taught since small children. He takes a basin of water and washes his hands in front of the crowd and says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. But the truth of the matter is, he's trying to pass on the buck. When the truth of the matter is, it stops with him. The buck stopped with him. He had made that fatal judgment against the Son of God and would one day stand in front of him and face judgment. And that's the situation we all face. That's the, situation, that's the situation we face every day. Every choice we make, we are responsible for. We can't escape responsibility. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we want to, not making a decision is still making a decision. And so for some of you this morning, Jesus stands before you as, as the Son of God and as your Savior. And the question has come, what are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to reject him for all the wrong reasons like Pontius Pilate did? Or are you going to receive him as the one who died for your sins, who rose again? Will you receive him in faith as your Savior and Lord? The buck stops with you. You can't pass it on. I didn't have the mini message to rearrange all my music. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. If you all would like to stand, we're going to sing Man of Sorrows. Um, it just, it just uh, goes along so well with what Shane was preaching about this morning um, and also about the the promise and victory that I'm sure we'll preach about next week. So um, please join me.
face that decision, and, and I don't want you to think it's anything to take lightly going, yeah, Shane, I've made that decision. No, it's a decision we make each and every day to pick up our cross and to follow Jesus. So, I'll ask the question again. Will you follow him? Or will you decide that the ways of the world aren't good enough for you? The ways of the world create strife, create conflict, create hurt. The ways of Jesus are the ways of peace, hope, love, mercy, grace, and so many more. So the buck stops with you. What are you going to do? We're going to close with a benediction this morning. I, I can't raise both arms up, but I'll raise one arm up. May you walk in his grace. Be filled with his hope. Be so overflowing with his joy that it just, it just sprays out everywhere you go in a good way. And God, we thank you for each person that's here. We thank you for all the ways in which you love us. And God, help us to go and share your love and your gospel news. Not just good news, God, but the best news ever of who you are with everyone we come into contact with. Go in peace, bearing his name, and bear it well. You are loved. <laughs>